before we get into the, our Pacific Division preview and in our interview with JD Burke, uh, JD Burke, um, the floodgates have opened. Kind of signings have started to happen around the league. Now, this wasn't the first one, but it's the most notable one, and we're going to talk about it first. Mitch Marner, Brad. Thankfully for you, it is the last time we have to talk about Mitch Marner for a little while. <laughs> Until the Leafs actually play the Red Wings. So pretty much the timeline on this was a few days ago, or four four or five days ago, uh, Bob McKenzie, uh, Elliot Friedman, and a bunch of other people essentially confirmed the contract offers that Mitch Marner turned down, which included seven years at $11 million per year, which in and of itself is a disgusting overpay. Um, I wouldn't say it's disgusting, but it's an overpay. It's a hell of an slightly, overpay. Slightly. Slightly. And, uh, I mean, the dude put up almost 100 points last year, Ryan. That was a flip. That was the, the switch flipped in the Toronto fan base where pretty much the last holdout supporting Marner, like, the public opinion changed rapidly. And then all of a sudden, we're hearing that talks are moving. And all of a sudden, we're hearing that Marner himself wants to get this done. And all of a sudden, we're hearing that Marner himself reached out to Dubas and instructed his camp to just get it done. And I was like, yeah, yeah, because I think you pushed it too far here, pal, because that is a bad contract to turn down. As in, like, it's a, you should not be turning down that contract. And this is coming from someone who always advocates for the player. Uh, and then, uh, all of a sudden, Mitch Marner was signed. Six years, 10.893. So six years at eleven million. That is still, in my mind, one point five million per year more than what Marner's worth at that length. Now, I think if you're going to overpay, you overpay your best players. Because if you overpay your middling players, your bottom end players, that's how you turn into the Red Wings or the Canucks. If you're going to overpay, overpay Mitch Marner. One point five million dollars per year is a substantial overpay in my mind. Even if you want to call it a mil per year the way that negotiation was handled, I sure hope for Mitch Marner's sake he play, he continues to play up to that contract. I love Mitch Marner. I think he's an incredible hockey player. I think he's one of the best wingers in this league, and I think he'll continue to be one of the best players in this league. But the way that whole thing was handled, it was just kind of a headache where even people who are fans of him like me, we're just saying, oh, come on, what is this? How are you asking for a Matthews comparable? Like, that's just not the case. Apparently, when he stepped on the ice for training camp today, he got a big ovation. Yeah. Well, kudos, kudos you know, genuinely kudos to him for recognizing it when it was almost on the brink of going too far and stepping in and saying, okay, we're done. Everybody was upset when he turned down seven uh, seven years, 11 million per. They're like, you're not going to get a better offer than that, a better deal than that. And then he got a better deal than that. Yeah. Because he got 11 mil essentially over six years. So now his, he's what, 22? 22. So cool. He's getting his next contract at 28. Yeah. He's cashing out twice. Yeah, but they do buy two UFA years. Uh, and it's not a horrible deal for Toronto either because they're getting six years. They're in their window now. Is Toronto concerned about this team seven years from now? No, of course they're not, nor should they be. Right now they have Matthews, Tavares, Marner, Nylander. Their only objective should be to figure out how to win when they have Tavares, Matthews, Marner, Nylander. Well, they have those guys locked. What they have to be concerned about is winning before Riley and Anderson and Muzzin and um, Barry need extensions. Well, you just mentioned two out of the three defensemen who are up next year. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, they're in a world of trouble. But here's the thing. Again, it, it's a forward-driven league. Yeah. They've got a good goaltender on a good contract. And... <laughs> Normally, I'd say on any other team, this wouldn't be an issue. But given that this we're having Babcock as a coach might actually be a problem is if you get down to crunch time in the playoffs, those are four. You could put two of those guys on the top line, two of those guys on the second line and basically never put the other lines on the ice if you really needed to, um, Mike, you know, could play them more than 18 minutes a game. But Mike Babcock, he's not on a hot seat, but he needs to succeed this year. And if he doesn't, I think he's gone. If he does more of this, you know, play the Marlowe types 25 minutes and play Matthews for 18, he's gone because they cannot be affording to waste these years anymore. The, Plain and simple. When, when all the fire Babcock jokes went up when Matthews only played 18 minutes in game seven, like I was like facetiously, I was loving it because obviously the way Babcock scorned Red Wings fans, even though he really didn't. Yeah, I, I thought it was funny. So I, I was here for it and joking around with it, but I, I didn't actually take it seriously that 
he should be fired. But then I started thinking about it. This team has Austin Matthews, John Tavares, William Nylander, and Mitch Marner in their prime. Morgan Riley in his prime. Frederick Anderson in his prime. There's no excuse here. No. There's none. There's zero. I'm not saying they're as good as Tampa, but they're not far off. No. The only difference between them and Tampa is depth. But of everybody, if you play your cards right, the players I just listed off, minus the goaltenders, will be on the ice, one of them, for about 70 to 80% of the game. And that's when the game is going to be won. It's as much as we love to say, oh, the fourth line makes a difference. And, you know, the the game is won in the trenches. Not anymore. It's not. No. It is not. It, Tampa was good because of Kucherov, Stamkos, Point, etc. The Blues won the cup because of O'Reilly, because of Petrangelo, because of Tarasenko. Your stars win you cups. You don't. Toronto has no excuse that you could argue they have what? Three of the 20 best players on the planet right now? Yeah. 100%. There's no way they shouldn't win because this is the exact same garbage we were saying about Pittsburgh all these years. You have Crosby and Malkin every year you don't win as a travesty. And it's the- true. It's true because if you're that good, if you have two top line centers, you are automatically a contending team in my mind. If you have two of the best centers in the world, you're automatically a contending team. The one year where people didn't realize this and they said, oh, Pittsburgh has no chance, they won the cup. And then they did it again with no defense. They had no serviceable defense. Like, it, it, a team of this caliber is a cup contending team. Anyone who says they're not is crazy because just look at last year when St. Louis won. St. Louis was not objectively not the best hockey team in the playoffs. They were just above the cutoff point for how good you need to be to win. And that wasn't two or three teams. When it gets down to the playoffs, again, we all talk about how much we love parity in the NHL nowadays. So even though we're saying Toronto should be competing for the Cup every year and, you know, win a couple playoff series every year, there's not a huge separation between the Leafs and whatever team is going to finish eighth. So circling back to the the point I was going to make about what you were saying, yeah, Babcock's got to be on the hot, hot seat this year because those little differences are what are going to win you the games in the playoffs. You play Matthews 24 minutes a game. You play Marner 24 minutes a game. You play Tavares 30 if you have to. You do what you need to do to win those games. And again, on paper, nobody should be beating them save for maybe Tampa. So, yeah, if they don't get out of the first round again this year, there's no excuse. None. Zero. Some other signings. Uh, Before Marner, Josh Morrissey was extended for eight years at 6.25 a year. Um, he's 24. I like Josh Morrissey. I think he's a really good defenseman. I think the way the numbers crunch, he'd be more of a high-end second pair guy. But if he's going to continue to progress and get better, by all rights, gamble on the cap going up, and yeah. and Morrissey's a safe gamble at that. You can you can have a definitely worse defenseman at that price. Yeah, he would be the best defenseman on the Red Wings by a lot, by a lot. Um, Ivan Provorov. Another six years. He's 22. Another six years at 6.75 a year. That's a good contract. Again, calculated gamble. Uh, Ivan Provorov is a guy where you're like, yeah, good player, just had a down year. But then you look at his numbers and you're like, ah, well, uh, a lot. And this is the this is part of where you really need to be well versed in analytics before you can start drawing too many conclusions from it. So I'm not going to declare that this is a bad deal. By no means. I would love, again, Ivan Provorov would be by far the best defenseman of the Red Wings. Hopefully, Phil Peronic prevents us from saying that in a year. Yeah. Um, but they pretty much really have to hope that last year was just a very down year for him. Otherwise, that might not look so great. But again, the cap is going to rise, and he's 22. And the season before this, he was tied for the league leading goals amongst defensemen? Something like that. So they're, they're, the talent's there. There's no question. It's just. Is it because of Philly or is it because of Ivan? Uh, Jared Spurgeon, who I believe will be 30 pretty soon, got a seven-year extension at 7.575 a year. I like Jared Spurgeon a lot. Definitely a candidate for most underrated player in the NHL. That contract is insane. Yeah, you cannot be giving a 30-year-old seven years at over seven and a half a year, especially because his contributions are more defensive. And like I'm... Everyone knows how much I value the defensive part of the game and how much I love strong defensive defensemen. He's good offensively, too. But he's 30. You're going to be paying... Going to be, I think. Yeah. You're going to be paying him until he's 36 or 37. Um, Because he's not a... This contract doesn't kick in until next summer. 
Yes. So you have to hope that he ages very gracefully. And I'm I'm not even going to go so far as to say you never give a 29 year old a contract like this. I'm going to say that this is under the context that it's the Minnesota Wild giving him this contract. Do are they the least self aware team in the league? They yes. are doing everything in their power to tread water. This is not a roster that is even close for contending for a cup. I admit, I think they'll be a lot better this year than people are giving them credit for. I think uh, based on the Vegas over-under point spreads, they're one of the better bets to pick the over on. But they're probably not going to make the playoffs still because that division's loaded. And this entire team, they're going to have like $40 million tied up in three or four players who are going to be... And we're not talking about the Leafs. <laughs> yeah, and they're but they're going to be all going to be like 33 uh, or older between Suter, Parisi, um, Spurgeon, and, and Zuccarello. Oh, the Zuc contract is bad. Like, that's going to be over $30 million, and they're all on the books for like seven more years, and Jared Spurgeon is the youngest of them. Sometimes I feel like time passes too quickly, and then I realize that we're only halfway through the Suter and Parisi contracts, and I'm like, no, we have a lot of time before we die. They are going to be with – those contracts are going to be with them forever. The the Minnesota Wild are doing what the Red Wings did four years ago, except they are doubling down on it when Detroit, after a few years, went, oh, okay, <laughs> enough of this. As soon as they missed the playoffs, Holland just went, yeah, all right, we're going the other direction now. Minnesota's like, yeah, we just missed the playoffs. Quick, let's sign all the old guys for even longer and more money to maybe get back to the playoffs. That's the sad part. Maybe get back to the playoffs next year. They might miss the playoffs this year. Imagine having all these guys at like 30 to 32 years old missing the playoffs and then realizing, oh boy, we have no cap room and all these guys for over half a decade still. Uh, the next contract I want to talk about pisses me off. Oh, it's Charlie McAvoy. Isn't Charlie it? McAvoy, three years at $4.9 million. How does Boston keep doing it? I am convinced they are kidnapping players' families and holding baseball bats to their shins. No, uh, what happened here is Don Sweeney sent Yarmo Kekalainen a real nice fruit basket oh my filled God. with anything he wanted because Wierenski signed first on a damn near identical contract. Yeah, I, I would much rather have Charlie McAvoy on that contract though, yeah? Ah, there's not a huge difference between them. Uh, I think McAvoy is the safer bet. I still think Warren has got some room to grow, whereas McAvoy, for the most part, is what he is. Um, I'm going to have to dive into the numbers on those guys because I have a feeling that... Wierenski's underlying numbers aren't great, but when you look at some of his defensive partners, it makes sense. Meanwhile, look, McAvoy said Chara. Boston's not completely immaculate in terms of contracts. They are paying David Backus for two more seasons at $6 million a year, essentially just to help you scratch him. But they have Brad Marchand and David Pasternak, and Patrice Bergeron, and Charlie McAvoy, and uh, Tori Krug, all for under $7 million. All for under $7 million. Some of them are under $6 million. Some of them are under $5 million. That is a phenomenally efficient team's in, team in terms of contract value. With You look at their... The, the amount of production they're getting that overvalues the am amount that they're paying for it. I, I worded that terribly. They contract good hockey players even better is the gist of it. You can never count out the Boston Bruins so long as they keep signing amazing deals like this. That is absolutely nuts. It makes me so angry as a fan of a team that is hampered by so many contracts where they're like, yeah, we're overpaying David Backus. It's like six mil. But we have Patrice Bergeron at 6.875. We have David Pasternak at 6.67. Brad Marchand at 6.125, yeah, Tory Krug at 5.25, and Charlie McAvoy at 4.9. Here, here's the reason I love the McAvoy contract, uh, uh, ignoring how we objectively dislike the Bruins. But just from a, uh, from a pure hockey brilliance standpoint, here's why I love the Wrensky and the McAvoy contracts. More so for McAvoy because Boston's really in their window right now. Obviously, you're getting three more years at McAvoy of incredible value in a window where you're – Shit, you should be competing for the cup, and yes. Boston will be. And the downside that people will immediately point out is, well, yeah, but he's going to be a UFA at 25, and you're going to have to pay him out the ass. 
Well, yeah, but the max you can sign him to is eight years. So you're telling me that I'm going to have to probably overpay by one or two million dollars a year for Charlie McAvoy. But then we get to punt him to the sun if we need to at age 33. That is it's ideal. perfect. This is the perfect structure. And then if he's still capable, you can give him a one year, two year, three year contract just to keep him on board. He'll be 32 so or 33. So you don't have to pay him too much because that's how the market works. Old guys don't get that much uh -huh. um, unless you're going to Minnesota. It's it's. Brilliant. Again, just like we were talking about Toronto, overpay the stars. If you're going to overpay, overpay the stars. What will Charlie McAvoy be worth at the end of this contract? Pro objectively, probably 8 to $9 million a year. He's probably going to ask for 10 11 And if you have to give him 10 11 for eight years, fine. Nobody's unhappy there. McAvoy's getting his payday. You get to keep a top pairing defenseman. Yeah, you overpay him by a mill or two, but guess what? That's why you sign bargain bottom six player deals and you have ELCs. It also makes it easier when they've not they've underpaid literally all of their stars at this point. Yeah, they're the one exception. I'm like it, people are making fun of the Leafs right now. Oh my god, they got over forty million dollars tied up in four players. Well, yeah, That's but how you have to do it. If this is how players, you do it. Or again, you kidnap players' families like Boston has done. Or you can overpay Darren Helm, Justin Abdelkader, Jonathan Erickson because that strategy has worked so well. No, you got fine. And we we joke about it as Red Wings fans all the time. AHL players can replace any of the Red Wings I just mentioned, and they make $700,000 a year. So if we had to overpay Larkin and Athens and Mantha each by a mill or two a year, cool. All that money is saved if Erickson, Abdulkader, and Helm aren't overpaid and we have AHL guys being paraded out. It's all about balance. A true superstar or even a true star player makes a difference in your roster. Downgrading from a, a pretty decent third-line winger to an all right fourth line winger doesn't impact your cup chances all that much. <laughs>